All right. Excellent. Um, now, Dean, are you able to advance slides? Like, if I give one of those old-fashioned bing sounds, then you can uh, you can move it a slide at a time. Is that possible? Um, nice. Very good. Um, so I'll go back and that that completely terrible introduction that I just did. Let's all pretend like it didn't happen, and we'll restart over. Um, I just lost the size again here of it um, on my computer, at least. Let's see. So just real quick, can everyone? Sorry, man. Um, you go for it. Steal the microphone if you want. Can you? Okay. So let's just start here. Can you guys see the the slides at this point? Can everybody see them? And then we're just going to plow ahead at this. Okay. Scott saying yes, so I'm going for it. All right. So. Um, so that first slide there you see, what we wanted to focus on was first the learning. And, and that's, um, I think certainly, as I said before, if we're going to have a conversation about the device, I think we need to, to have a little bit of exposition about what it takes to set up a device. And I'm sure that Scott has, uh, and I know that Scott has similar ideas on this as we've talked this through um, together for, for quite a few years. Um, Dean, if you can skip ahead to skip the next slide and then the next one, that's a little video. So cultivating idea, like, like I was saying before, oh, there you go, yeah. So we got together a committee um, that was composed of stakeholders from uh, representation from all our stakeholder groups. Uh, we had a board members, parents, um, we had staff members, support staff, uh, just all different areas of our uh, school district got together and we started having conversations. And like I said before, we looked at the fact that we had a 9 to 1 student to computer ratio and realized that that's not going to allow us to, to engage in learning the way that we wanted to engage it. So we came up with what we said would be our ideal scenario for how we would like to incorporate more technology or just give students more access to technology in, uh, in our district. So we got together this group, came up with our, our idea, and our scenario was that we would have a one-to-one, -one, and we said idealistically, let's not talk about money yet, so let's talk about, you know, in our ideal world of the district, what we'd like to have. We established we'd like a one-to-one -one in grades three through eight, and then we'd like a grade level cart of some device uh, in grade levels K through two. We also have an early childhood program at one of our buildings, and we wanted to include them as well. So I guess I should say pre-K through two, we wanted a grade level cart of devices, and then a one-to-one -one three through eight. Um, Dean, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. And we asked the question, what should be transformed? So what should change? And, and we don't have time um, for this conversation. I'm sure you guys have talked about this throughout this course. But the idea that you can't just give people a device or give students a device and expect things to change. Uh, you can do research on, on many, many one-to-one -one initiatives uh, where that's essentially what they did. And a lot of those initiatives stopped after three to five years, if even that long, and they didn't refresh the program because they realized nothing's changed. Uh, things have stayed the same. So I think one conversation that, that, that has to take place, and you have to work through this in your district, is say, what will it look like when we have these devices uh, in our students' hands? Because if you think about it, if you think about the power of allowing students to have access to any device that can access the Internet, you know, essentially, not, not quite there yet, but essentially the sum of all human knowledge available and accessible at the fingertips of students, that has to change our notion of uh, you know, how we deliver content. Uh, is, that, is that even relevant, the whole notion of delivering content? You know, wh why do we choose what we choose to teach? And if you all haven't read the, uh, the Seth Godin piece, The Stop Stealing Dreams, I I'd highly recommend that you take a look at that piece because it's, it's, so, it's so profound in a lot of ways to talk about how we started out with the content and we just continue to add and add and add more content, and that's what our school is about, kids memorizing trivia that they're bound to forget as they get older. Is that the value of our institutions? So wrestle with those conversations. Do what Jim Collins says. You know, get the people together in the room and have and negotiate, have the deep conversations, um, and talk about what this is going to look like. And, and I'd say that this has to be your beginning. Uh, you have to talk this through. And again, I wish we had more time tonight to, to get into this part of the conversation, because this is the most important part of what you'll talk about. Um, the, the, Certainly the beginning, um, very, very important. Uh, go ahead, next slide, Dean, if you don't mind. 
So we established and came up with what do we want our goals to be? Um, what is it that we want our students to do and, and focus on with uh, the implementation of this one-to-one -one device? Uh, next slide, please, Dean. Thank you. You're, you're an excellent remote. Um, Scott can tell you about the experience we just had recently watching a keynote speaker use a human remote, and it was epic. Um, that's a different story for a different time. Um, all right, so, so we focused on five main points um, to begin with, and that's the five you see there, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration, creativity. Um, and, and again, I'd, I'd recommend you have the conversations that need to take place. What is critical thinking? What does that look like? What is a student who embodies that? Uh, what, what is it, how does that manifest itself in a student's everyday life and in their capacity to demonstrate the ability to critically think, um, to also to problem solve, all of those points. And with those, we also have um, as part of this that the foundational learning that we wanted students to take place. You know, when we, we did town hall meetings for our parents, and explained our idea to them that we were going to pursue a one-to-one -one in grades five through eight to start. And a lot of parents voiced a concern. We have a, it's a blue collar community uh, where I'm from. It's, you know, uh, it's a very middle class, working class uh, group of parents. And they were very concerned that, you know, technology is nice, but what about reading and writing and math? And we said that this is not supplanting those things. This is allowing us to engage them in a much deeper level. Um, so that's another important piece to, to communicate to your constituency that, uh, that through a one-to-one, -one, your goal is not technology. It's not to teach kids to use a computer. Uh, your goal is to engage them in the process of learning in a deeper way. So we established our goals. All right, next slide. Thank you. We established that we wanted to facilitate and design a culture of learning. I won't talk again too much about this because I know um, that our intent was to talk about the devices. So we, we just want to talk about how we establish this culture of learning for our staff and for our students and allowing our staffs to empower them um, to learn through the devices as well. And you'll notice that those kids are holding iPads. That's our kindergarten. Uh, those are our kindergarten students and they are um, working on the uh, on the iPads, uh, for, we just felt that that was the most appropriate uh, device for them, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Next slide. Thank you. Also, the idea of student ownership, uh, allowing students to take take control of their learning. And that, the, these things I'm talking about right now, it's not necessarily to a device. It's important for um, for what they're doing with that device. And so, student ownership when Actually, it's a great story. We had about three weeks into our one-to-one -one implementation, our director of student services went into um, a classroom in our middle school that was a, had a lot of student needs, uh, very, you know, very high level of students with special uh, learning needs. And she went around to talk to them about how their netbooks are doing and how they're doing with them. And one student told her, she said, it used to be that when I didn't know an answer, I didn't know something that the teacher was talking about, I'd never raise my hand to ask the question and say, well, what do you mean or what are you talking about? She said, I didn't want anyone to know I didn't know the answer. I didn't want anyone to know that, I, you know, that well, first off, I'm just not going to raise my hand and, and speak in front of the class. She said, when I have my netbook now, she said, I, I, when a teacher says something I don't know, I look it up. She said, I take control and I have ownership of my own learning. And, and those are her actual words that she said to our director. And, really struck me and our director and, and, and as we've told that story to people that kids now have control of their, their own learning. You know, we're, they're not beholden to what a teacher uh, is, is delivering to them or the content in a book. Uh, the world is, is available to them again at their fingertips. We're facilitating that learning journey for them um, in a way that they own it more than we, uh, you know, we, we direct or dictate the specific content they're going to cover. Um, let's go to the next slide, Dean. Thank you. So this is what I was talking about before, our process. Uh, this is the process we went through, and this is the process I'd recommend anyone go through when they're to, you know, thinking about a one-to-one, a -one, and that is you set your goals first. What is it you want your program to do? Um, you know, ask the great question. A couple guys, uh, Ryan Bretag and David Jakes, um, they're from Chicagoland area as well, and they asked this question I think is so important that we need to ask, and that's, what is what does it mean to be well educated? You know, you can say in the 21st century, even today. But what does it mean to be well educated? Because that answer has changed over the last 20, 25 years for sure. Um, you know, based on this an older model of learning, based on what's happened and what's changed in society. So you look at your goals. What does it mean to be well educated in your institution? And what goals do you want to establish? Then you need to consider your culture. That's a big part of it. And I'm sure Scott's going to speak to that because that's what Scott and I have talked about a lot when we're 
discussing device selection is you need to be mindful of the culture of your uh, your institution. And that's not to say that you can't reculture because I'll tell you when you have a one-to-one -one, you're going to be reculturing. Things are going to be different. They will change. But you also need to, to be prepared and be mindful and cognizant of what your culture is in your district uh, as far as if you're a certain platform, is it going to be too difficult to significantly change and go to a different platform? Uh, you know, what, what is the culture of student ownership, of, of different aspects within your institution that you need to be aware of? And then finally, the, the third piece there is cost. Um, and that's, I think a lot of times people default to the cost, and I'm going to explain that in a minute, you know, how we determined our cost, but some people think, and in, and in my rationale as I've talked about netbooks, people think that I jumped to cost first, and it's not true. I, I, I say, what is it we can do with our devices to meet our goals? That drives everything we're doing. Because if our devices don't allow us to meet our goals, then it's completely pointless you know, to, peak, to, to pick a cheap device or pick an inexpensive device you can afford because it's not going to allow you to do what, you, what it is you want to do. So you put these three things together and that gets you to your device selection. All right, go ahead, next slide, Dean. So the way I broke this down is, and I'll, I'll because again, we don't have time to necessarily go through all of um, you know, breaking deeper into the, into the um, goals and the, and the culture, but when I looked at the cost of our devices, so I'll break down how, how I looked at this. We started off looking at a netbook. That top one is a netbook. Uh, it's an HP model. It's $267. Um, it runs Linux, so anything we put on it is free. Um, there's no additional software licensing needed. Uh, and talk about some of the unique uh, design features in a second. Uh, but when we looked at the cost of that, so this is just kind of easy math for me because I'm terrible at math. So if we looked at buying, let's say your, your environment is looking to buy a thousand of these for a one-to-one -one implementation. If you had, you know, looking at the, the netbooks, it's $267 each. So obviously easy math is $267,000 if you're going to implement a one-to-one -one at a thousand units. Next in the list is an iPad. That's an iPad 2. You can buy those in bulk. The bulk price is $449 uh, per device. So if you project that out, that's $449,000. Then the next one is, is, a, is a PC. That's an HP DM4 uh, model. It's a very nice computer anodized aluminum backlit keyboard. Um, it's very, very nice. Um, that's $679 a unit. Again, project that out, do the math at $679,000. Finally is the MacBook, and I, some of you may be aware that Apple has now discontinued and no longer do they even have any end-of-life units. So this is a bit of an old slide already because the, the MacBook isn't available anymore for $849. It's, uh, now they're selling the MacBook Air for education for $999, so you can increase that number up to $999 if you want. Um, but the point is, uh, go to the next slide, Dean, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, the point is when you look at your cost, I, I would highly, highly recommend that you do this exercise. Look at the, you know, whether it's Chromebooks, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a different PC model, whatever the models are that you're looking at, run an analysis of the units you're going to buy, the cost of the units, and then what that cost is going to be total and a difference. Because what we have to ask ourselves is, for our goals, for what we want to do, the HP netbook sets the baseline of cost. For an additional $182,000, we can get iPad 2s. But our question and what we came up with and what we determined for our environment, A, just on a device-to-device on a, you know, -device comparison, we felt the netbook allows us to do a little more of what our goals are, and I'll share that in the next slide. But is it worth, the device you're looking at, is it worth that additional cost? Think and you ask yourself, what other things could I get for $182,000? And Scott, I'm sure, will make a, a great point of the many, many uses that an iPad 2 has, things like document cameras. He's doing some great things with, uh, with Apple TVs, and the iPad 2 is a, is a document camera slash smartboard slash a bunch of stuff. So you can factor some of that in for price if that's something that you're using. Um, for us and our purposes, we already had smart boards in our rooms. Um, that wasn't an issue. And you know, I'm, I'm on the record of not being the biggest fan of smart boards anyway, but I, I think that the, the device in the hands of the kids is the most important thing. So we asked ourselves, for $182,000, what else could we get? And think about the professional development you can get. Think about the other devices. For us, we actually got a couple of carts of MacBooks at each school for higher end, like iMovie, um, things like that, higher end multimedia. And we still came in uh, well, well under 
uh, you know, we we still had, and I want to say we were at 130,000 or, or so. Um, you know, and these aren't our real numbers because we didn't buy a thousand units. Um, but you you could buy a card of these and evaluate that. And then looking up at the the PC, it was 412,000. Then all the way up to the MacBook, 582,000. So when you run this analysis again, consider what are the things. Um, these are sorry, these are uh, thanks. Um, that that only person that can be in the chat room. Um, is um, some guy who I forgot his name, so he's irrelevant. Um, so th these uh, costs, if you look at the costs, these are American dollars. Um, go to the next slide if you don't mind, Dean. Thank you. Um, so when it comes down to it, we looked at the cost, and then we looked at what our students have on our netbooks. Um, they have full control of their device, and, and I mean full control of the device. They're not relegated to the experience that Apple is driving for them. Uh, they're not held to this is the way it's going to be. These are the apps you can run. Um, they can install uh, applications. They have full admin control. They have access to the terminal. Um, they can, if they want a script, they can do uh, basically what they want with the device. If they have a problem, and this is um, this is an issue that some people, you know, worry about with admin control of a device is what if something happens? What if the kids, you know, download a program that doesn't work? What if it, it breaks the the software on there? Uh, we have a quick restore feature on these netbooks, and I should say that, uh, that we're running uh, Ubermix. Ubermix is a, a version of Linux uh, that Jim Klein. I, I lost my screen. I don't know if you guys did too. It doesn't doesn't matter at this point, I guess. But um, Jim Klein, uh, if you want to look up and know more about Ubermix, Jim Klein uh, says that it's um, it's a it's, what well, Jim Klein says. Jim Klein developed this. Uh, you know this image, uh, and it's a very, very smart image uh, that again allows us to refresh. So let's say something happens to the student's computer. They turn it back on. They hold the escape key at startup. They can refresh the machine, and they can restore it back to its original state, but retain all of the program files that they have, so or all their user files. So basically, anything they've created that stays in a third partition and keeps it. So about 90, 95 percent of issues we'll have, um, we can just Restore the machine, and the kids are up and running, and still have all of their files. Um, autonomy again; the kids dictate the experience. They can program on it. They can do whatever they want on the device, um, for the most part. Now, multimedia. There are some multimedia uh, applications. We have Audacity on there. We have OpenShot, which is a video editor. Um, but they're not. They're not really. Uh, you know, if you're talking about higher ends type of uh, a multimedia usage. You know, they, they won't run something as like iMovie as well uh, as a MacBook will, which is why we have the carts of those for those times when kids do that. But if you're doing recording, podcasting, digital storytelling, these devices can do that. I have the complete web. And I say that because I know a lot of people say you know, Flash is, is you know, not really that relevant anymore because not that many people use it or there are not that many great sites. But the reality is we still have a lot of our, our resources that are uh, utilizing Flash, fortunately or unfortunately, and as we know on the iPad, you just can't run uh, run Flash on it. So kids have a complete web experience. Also, Google Docs is so important for us, and that's really one of was one of the main decision points for us as well. Because one of our our major endpoints into our one to one is utilizing Google Docs with staff and students. And the experience right now is just very limited, and it's not um, it's it's not that positive. Uh, it's, not full experience on the iPad if anyone's experienced that. Um, on the netbooks, they run Chrome and it's a full experience. And, and innovation as well, like I said, um, we allow the kids to, to create and to work through uh, you know, their, their multimedia. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, Dean. I think that's, that's it. Um, run through, try to, as much as I can, um, not pay attention to people like John Becker um, in the comments. but. Um, I think the briefcases like this picture. Yeah, we have we use higher ground gear just at our middle school. Um, we use a higher ground gear case, uh, netbook case. Uh, when they go between classes, it it helps with with drop inch. In our fifth grade classes, they don't use the cases because they're in one homeroom, um, so they're not you know doing uh, they don't they don't need them as much. Um, so that that's kind of the. I won't even say it's brief because I talked. I know I a lot of words right there. Um, but that that's what we went through considering why netbooks because of the cost, because of what we could do with it, um, because it's it, in in some cases it's more open, in some cases it's not. There there are certain apps certainly for the iPad that I know Scott will talk about. So um, I'll let him 
uh, kind of hand it over to him, let him talk, um, let him explain his his rationale, and and then provide any response to any questions that might come up after that. All right, can everybody hear me? All right, so what I'd like to do is go ahead and show my screen here. Let's see if I can get that done. So we're going to start by sharing the entire desktop here. All right, so does everybody see um, my screen there? I just moved it over. Hey, thanks, Ben. So does everybody see the screen there? just want to know if you see my iPad screen. All right, so I just want to run through a couple things. Um, obviously, you know, Ben and I are actually on the same page in so many ways. So when Dean uh, called us up in the, or DM does and said that, hey, can we debate this a little bit, the irony is we're obviously more on the same page than anything. And we totally agree, and we actually talk all the time. You know, you have to look at a lot of factors, and I just listed out some of them briefly. You know, what age groups are you working with? What's the local culture, previous history, economic situation, your budget, expectations? And a lot of this that Ben already went through, right? Um, I don't think Ben mentioned that, uh, but I think they are going with uh, uh, iPads, for example, for their K through 2 when they're looking at those devices. So, you know, when you start talking about going one-to-one -one and what specific device you want, you have a lot of factors to look at. It's not going to be something that's going to, um, uh, sorry, I was distracted by the, the comments there to make sure you can see. You're, there's so many factors that go into it, it's not going to be an obvious, you know, hey, it's this specific dice, uh, device for it. Uh, you know, when we look at our district, for example, where uh, our district is historically very Apple-based, and to kind of switch to a new platform uh, in a holistic way, such as Ben's, I don't know if that makes sense for what we're going to be trying to do. You know, we have a, a long history with Apple. We've got lots of professional development that's pushed into it. Uh, I realize that when you're talking about one-to-one, -one, the kids are going to act a lot faster. But, you know, at the same time, how much money have we spent for teachers to get prepared for that? So we're in those questions right now in the new district that I've started working with, which is in uh, Downers Grove uh, last July 1st. I do want to point out that even though I'm talking about the iPad, I guess, that uh, if you look here, I really believe that, you know, look at more than just the iPad. It's the iDevices. So in Kenilworth, which is my previous district that I helped, um, they've been piling one-to-one -one iPod touches. And so I would throw it back, you know, if you're going to start talking about cost and things you want to do, I just think about, hey, you know, if in Ben's example, you could probably get uh, about $74,000 in savings if I did the math right. Um, and then you could also buy another additional three MacBook carts uh, that would be full. So what's interesting, it just depends on what you want to do. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. You just have to, you're right, you have to look at the total cost of ownership. So to throw some of those kind of discussions out there, uh, replacement of classroom devices. Right now, we're not 100% sure we're comfortable with the uh, netbooks and their long or end of life uh, cycle. You know, and we're also looking at, in our district currently, we don't have a lot of smart boards that have been implemented, so uh, we have lots of clamoring for that. But the way that we're looking at the iPad is that it could replace uh, the device such as a document camera, a smart board, still cameras, video cameras in the classroom. So when you start adding in lots of factors like that, it starts to change that math a little bit more, especially if you look at the end of life of the device. Now, we're okay with thinking that netbooks can be there, but we're just not sure, and we're a little bit more comfortable at this time with the iPads, for example. But once again, it really goes back to stick with purpose. And I just wanted to point out, we've also had lots of discussions like, hey, why not, you know, if we do go with some kind of Im implementation of iDevices in a one-to-one, -one, perhaps we look at netbooks for our writing class, almost like uh, Ben was saying in his district, where they're going to pull out so they have that full-on Mac experience, maybe we need that folks just for those writing classes. Or maybe we do just provide keyboards for the iPads in those classes, et cetera. And also, I, I really, you know, when you look at total cost of ownership, I start looking at percentage of day and how they're used. You know, does this include how devices are used in fine arts and in PE? Um, you know, I was just kind of doing some searches earlier and just throw it out there. I've been searching a lot. This is just a district Episcopal Middle School Netbook Handbook. 
And what's funny is I see this too many times, but if you lock, look down at their network, netbook experience, it says locker stores. Netbooks will be locked in students' lockers during the following times, art classes, recess, lunch, PE, athletic or school practices. And I begin to question, you know, how are netbooks being used? Where what's interesting is that you see the iPad really flourishing in these other uh, experiences. So make sure I got the windows open here. So when you look at total cost of ownership, you have to really factor in a lot. It's not going to be just that base cost. You know, we also talk about battery life and how they're going to uh, charge their device. You know, Ben's district did a great job of looking at how they're going to keep their uh, netbooks charged up. And maybe when we get some questions and answers, they'll be able to share a little bit more. But also, you know, there's also the total cost of ownership for protective gear. I mean, there's just so much to that equation. So moving further, though, I just want to also talk about, once again, that age of user, you know, when you have a K through 2, obviously any type of device has to be very straightforward. And, and obviously we're seeing that uh, the eye devices are very good for the age group. Third grade enough, and that's when it really starts to change the equation. Also, I was just going to point out, we're, you know, a lot of people talk about how the iPad is a fragile device in comparison, but we're not seeing that. Um, oh, look, I even spelled my own district wrong right there. Nice. So in Downers Grove, we're only seeing about 1% of our devices actually broken. A fellow uh, colleague of ours here in Illinois, his name is Jim O'Hagan, and he's seen about 4% of his devices. And I don't know, I would say is this a superior platform in many ways. Now, I do realize that, uh, you know, you're not going to open them up and be able to, to kind of fix them as needed. But at the same time, if you're getting a lower percentage, well, then you don't have to. You know, it kind of goes back to what Ben is saying, this idea of being able to reboot the device. I don't know what I... What I find fascinating is just you don't really have to reboot the iDevice nearly as much. Uh, or if you do, it's a very, very quick pro process, for example. But anyways, we can, you know, keep going. To me, it looks like, you know, open source is great in so many ways, and that's why I'm really keeping an eye on what they're doing. But it also depends on the number of developers out there and the uniqueness of those apps. And right now, we're leaning towards the iDevice because we're a little bit more confident that the future of development is going to happen with these devices more than open source. Maybe we're just totally wrong with that. Uh, I just want to point out, you know, a lot of people talk about with the lack of multitasking. Uh, we're actually seeing some benefits with that with the iDevice. So, for example, um, the instant on, and I know what's fantastic about the netbooks that Ben's got in their district is something that's less than 30 seconds, I believe, for uh, a complete reboot. You know, so we're looking for that instant on. So when kids are in the hallway or in the lunchroom or outdoors, they can just get right to it. Uh, What's fascinating is that people always say the iDevice is a bummer because you can't really monitor it the same way. Well, if you walk over and double click the home button, you're going to see what's the last uh, app open. And really what I'm getting at is it's the change in understanding of workflow that's really going to change how people understand these devices. Uh, important platforms, you know, once again, if you're going to look at Google Apps as, a, as your central platform and that's what you're seriously focused on, well, I think that makes a lot of sense to be looking more at the netbook. However, if you're going to use tools such as Evernote or iTunes U or as uh, somebody was talking to the class earlier about iBooks Author, then I think that begins to change your discussion. Once again, it's just there are so many ways to look at these devices. You have to understand the physical nature of the devices involved. You know, I'm just throwing out real quick examples. So we have motion math, QR codes. Uh, these are devices or activities that, you know, really takes advantage of the specific nature of it. So just to point out some examples here. So if we're going to go in and uh, let's see here. You know, if you have something like Tourist, Tourist is going to be an app, for example, and I'll just pull open one here just to kind of get a feel for it. You know, this is dependent on being able to move the device around. So hopefully that's, you can see that. So right now I'm moving around my iPad and showing this. Whatever you see in the directions is the direction the iPad is, is, is going. You know, I don't see and I don't hear teachers talking about the nature of the device, you know, with uh, netbooks, et cetera, like this. And there's so many examples you can get into this. You know, we have this application here called WordLens, which basically you point it at something and uh, let's see if I can do this here with everybody watching here. Eh, it's not going to be good on the monitor. Yeah, that's just not a good example. But the idea is that you can then use this device to do things that are different because of the physical nature of swiping, etc. You can see all my different apps in here. You know, I'm going to pull up an, maybe somewhat of a simplistic or silly activity, but this is called uh, uh, Pottery HD. 
And just on the device itself, you're going to go ahead and make new ones. I should have had this ready ahead of time here. But literally on this device, you begin to make this. You make these by uh, morphing the clay. So let me get out of here. It should have been ready for my example here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit create. And if you notice, I'm now physically moving and changing the clay. Now, obviously, I understand that's not the same experience of using clay, but the very physical nature of this device is completely different from a netbook. So it's really kind of an unfair comparison. You know, I can keep going on and on, but I really think, you know, I'll share out this, all this different information here with uh, Dean and you can share with the class, but I would challenge you to say that they're completely different devices. You know, when you start talking about the defined arts and reading on the web, you know, to be very clear, reading on an iDevice is very, very different uh, experience. You know, I think I would be remiss if I didn't talk about iBooks. You know, I don't know how many uh, of you out there have tried to read a full-on novel on a netbook or on a laptop, and it's just not a very good experience, right? But reading on an iPad or on an iPod Touch is a very enjoyable experience. Um, let's see here. So let's go ahead and I'll open up a favorite of, oops, I clicked the wrong one, but that's okay. So we have Axel the truck. It's not a favorite of mine, let's be very clear. I'm sure Dean's going to be tweeting that forever now. So, you know, but this is going to go ahead and read aloud here. Okay, so you can actually have the uh, sound on. Um, you can start re reading to yourself. There's ways to record. It highlights the words as you go. So just to kind of jump out. I guess what I'm saying is it's kind of a almost a silly discussion because they're drastically different. And it goes back to everything that Ben said. I really think you have to look at what age groups are you working with? What's your local culture, your previous history, your economic situation? You know, with the iPad 3 in theory getting announced um, Wednesday, uh, our Apple representatives are salesmen already talking, hey, your, your Apple II is going to be reduced $100. So it depends on when you're in your cycle. If they're reduced $100 now, that drastically changes your story on whether you should go one-to-one -one or not. So I don't know. Don't get so stuck on which specific device. Ask those questions that Ben and I are constantly asking. You know, what age groups are you talking about? What's the local culture, your previous history? And just then after you get an identity of what you wanted to do, then you can have a little bit more specific discussions. Okay, which platform is more appropriate for us at this time? So I don't want to steal too much time because I know we got lots of questions. So, uh, Dean, I'm going to hand it back to you so maybe we can answer some questions. Let's see how I do that. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Well, both really nice overviews on, on your thinking and your specific um, uh, situations and environments and, and uh, the thinking that, that you've gone through. And I mean, many of us um, have experienced all these variety of tools in our personal lives. And I guess I'm uh, what I'd like to maybe hear from um, both of you is, uh, I mean, I know, Scott, you've not necessarily done the one-to-one, -one, but at any rate, even Ben, talk a little bit about the fact that, okay, so here we are, you know, uh, over halfway down a school year, and, and Ben particularly, since you began this September, what kinds of things are you actually seeing that would point to, you know, feeling like you're you're on the right track with the goals and uh, that you've set out for you? So maybe, Ben, if you want to tackle that question, and then, uh, Scott, you can address it as well. And if you have other, if folks have other questions, type them in the chat room or whatever. Um, but uh, I'll start with Ben around uh, what you're seeing so far. Okay, so I'm guessing, um, not guessing, but um, I, was, I was too busy trying to compliment Scott that I was only halfway listening being a uh, story of my life. Um, but as far as what we've been seeing in our building, uh, a lot of those things that I talked about with uh, the, the change of culture, watching our students take ownership uh, of their learning. And if you go and watch, we have the second slide in that slide deck that isn't linked because it's on SlideShare is a video uh, that we have. And actually, let me see if I can quickly, while I'm trying to talk uh, and make sense of this, uh, go drop a, a link to uh, right here. This is a, a, a drop the link here in the room. Um, this is our first. That, that video right there is our, our first video which we're going to work to try to tell our story of what we've experienced and what's happened. And uh, 
you hear in there that some of the teachers, we interviewed three teachers, one eighth grade, one fifth grade, and one kindergarten teacher uh, about the experience and what they're seeing in their classroom. I think their words are very, very telling um, that we're seeing this shift as we're allowing kids to take ownership. And, and again, and I have to come back to this, I think a, a much broader conversation needs to take place right now in education because you see in too many districts that these initiatives don't work because we keep trying to do the same old thing uh, just with a new tool. You know, we're digitizing old pedagogy. We're, we're basically, and the concern I have with a lot of apps on the, on the iPad, and certainly not the ones necessarily that Scott was showing, but in a lot of cases, we're making apps that are just a digital version of a worksheet, uh, drill and kill. Uh, it's, it becomes a low-level thinking. It's a quick-hitting activity um, that is not a broader, uh, ex more expansive experience for students. And I think right now one of the values of technology, again, is that access to information, the fact that uh, you know, look at Slater.com, which has every single high school math book and college math book online with examples, with all of the uh, um, answers. In that case, you know, what, what does that do to our notion of teaching and learning, um, and how does that change it? So we, we're at that point where we need to figure that out and, and then see how that manifests itself uh, in the classrooms. Um, because we've seen even in this first year, you know, we're maybe a half year into our first year of a one-to-one -one implementation, we just are having some excellent conversations that are taking place uh, amongst our staffs, with our students, about the, the idea of what changes when kids all have this. So as far as how our goals are going, um, we've been really happy with how we are, you know, certainly able to use Google Docs, the collaboration, the critical thinking, all of that, that whole list that I shared with you, you know, what what it was that, that it's affording, the opportunities it's affording our students um, have been profound. You know, before this year, I did, I've done probably four years worth of research on one-to-ones as I've explored it in a previous district than this one. And I expected it, but I don't think I was fully prepared for what a difference it makes when you do have uh, these devices in the hands of kids. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's incredible, but also, and I think I saw someone just come by um, or someone just, uh, what's teacher PD look like? Um, that's, that's a big part of it is you have to be ready to change the culture of, uh, you know, of learning, uh, change the culture of, of what teachers. And a lot of teachers will, um, in the beginning, and I'll admit this, I'll say it openly, you know, it's difficult to give up control um, to this level. And that's something we're working through. We're also working through a broader curriculum plan that's changing our focus on, uh, you know, it's, it's that first slide of our superintendent saying making learning irresistible. That's our call. That's our cause. We want kids to love to come and learn in our buildings, in our classrooms. Um, that's what we're focusing on now. And, and I truly believe our device is, is helping us along that path uh, without question. All right, I've over talked, so I'll, I'll go to Mike and let Scott address that. No, I think somebody mentioned in the room just now that's ultra important is what you guys have done and allow your kids to program within the device. I can't, you know, we can't look past it. I mean, that's a huge bonus. My issue is that too many districts that look at one-to-one -one devices don't look at that and they see any importance in that. You know, the administrative side of your device is, is key. I see too many one-to-ones that are still focused on, well, we can't even give kids email or, you know, we can't really <laughs> access their online web tools. I mean, that's not a true one-to-one. -one. So the first thing that's important is no matter what we talk about from the iDevice to uh, Ben's, um, you know, open source networks is, are you really one-to-one -one with that device or is it just a project tool? But I still go back to there are key things that, you know, you can get into that's different between the iPad and, and the, the netbook is it's the physical nature of it. Um, it's the idea that, you know, reading on an a iPad is totally different. It's doing the fine arts and, and the things, you know, if you're going to look for a couple of resources out there, I would suggest checking out Kevin Honeycutt and what they're doing uh, or what he's helping districts do. I would look at uh, um, a teacher in Illinois, the Illinois Art Teacher of the Year, and her name is Trisha Fugelstad and what they're doing with iDevices. I just don't see that kind of stuff getting done with netbooks. Uh, it's just because it is a different device. I will say, you know, when you start talking about having kids programming and stuff, I mean, what about having kids programming apps? You know, there is that uh, way to get kids into that. And I realize there's some things to overcome as far as the licensing, et cetera, but schools are doing it. So I guess, really, if I could share anything, it's, it doesn't matter what device it is. It's going to be 
what are you trying to do? For us, it definitely makes sense to be looking at the iDevice more closely than the, uh, the netbooks. I'll throw it back to you there, Ben, or Dean. No, go ahead. I mean, if you guys, uh, are there just, I mean, there's a few little uh, ideas that are in the chat box that you guys can feel free to respond to as well. But I'm just wondering, particularly for my students, if you have, if you have any questions, uh, you know, based on things you experienced either in your internship or your schools uh, that you that you uh, participated in, or just questions that you might have about uh, the kinds of decisions and and uh, what the, what these classrooms would look like. So I just want to leave that for my students first of all to um, if they have any specific questions. Uh, one of the questions that I have is, I guess what, um, I, I guess there's going to be two questions. Number one, how do you go about kind of implementing a, um, I, I guess a full rollout of, of either one operating system or another? So if a school is already an, uh, a PC school and they're trying to use Macs for their, for their multimedia classrooms, how do you go about um, making sure that, that you kind of convince the administration and, and your school division that using both of these operating systems is beneficial to students. And I guess the second question is, um, if if there already is a switch with respect to using Apple and Microsoft in the same school, how how do you make it so that the crossover works out well with people who are who are familiar with each? Well, I'd like to share before Ben jumps in, you know, when we're looking at PD for iDevices, the clear focus that we've had that really has helped us uh, with teachers have a better approach is focus on that they are creation devices, that they're very creative and they're not just for consumption. The consumption is the obvious part that people just get right off the bat. You know, reading on a device, going on the web, the pinch and zoom, all of the accessibility features, that's the easy stuff that people see immediately. It's unfortunately they get stuck into what I think somebody typed in there is the apps are in silos. And once we've shown people how to get through the workflow, it's so much easier to understand. I actually see the benefit of working in those silos as a benefit um, because, you know, the nature of shifting between applications isn't really as easy as people describe on a full-blown uh, laptop, et cetera. But uh, let me throw it back to Ben. He can add in how they've approached PD. I think the... the the way the, the question was, was the, the switch or the, the rationale between multiple operating systems um, within your district. And, um, you know, please feel free to, to you know, provide any further explanation if I don't quite answer it. But, um, you know, the way that we, we've gone about explaining it is the fact that look at an operating system a couple of years ago. Look how much different it is now than, you know, look at Microsoft Word. Look at the difference between 2003 and 2008. Um, you know, we, we don't have to do much to, to tell people, you know, when these kids get out of school, the operating system as it is, we don't know what it's going to be, what it's going to look like. We want kids to be adaptable and to learn, and that's one of the things that allows, what Ubuntu allows us and affords us the opportunity is for students to, um, you know, to, to problem solve authentically right there in the device. So they learn the operating system, and they learn it in about two minutes, and, and that's not an exaggeration. When we deployed, we gave the students the devices, and within literally within two minutes they, they had a grasp of it and were, were maneuvering with our problem and teaching the teachers. And that's part of the culture as well that we ex really ex expressed and, and um, you know, told teachers to, to consider allowing students to teach them through this process. You know, you know the why of what you're doing. Release the how a little bit to the students. Let them work through the programs, the applications, uh, the different um, pieces to it. So uh, we worked through, through all of that. And, you know, as far as, um, you know, some of the questions, we're, and we're not PC, we're, we're, we're Mac and, um, and Linux. So uh, we don't have PCs right now um, in our district. So I don't know if we need more follow-up to that. And this time I, I, I will, will address, um, you know, the fine arts and, and the role um, the devices have in that uh, if there aren't other questions. Sorry, I get uh, distracted here. Did you uh, throw it back to me, Ben? 
No, I pretty much just dropped it on the table and said they're done with it. Okay, I was just going to say that um, I absolutely I think the devices are perfect for K through two, but uh, I don't know, Ben. Why? Just to share out, did you guys think about using the netbooks with the K through two? I mean, is there value or is there a difference, or what was your thoughts? Yeah, we use them, and actually, first grade and second grade have a, a grade level cart, and then we have one cart for of iPads for kindergarten that can be shared up with the other primary grades. Um, we found second grade is fine with the uh, netbooks and then um, you know third grade and up certainly um, are, are, do a, a great job with it. Um, you know, with, with working with their netbooks. And you know our first grade kids all can uh, they all can podcast right now using their netbooks. You know, they're they're all able to do the the creation that we talk about. They're able to maneuver that and work with it um, without an issue. So um, the kindergarten kids, uh, there's no doubt that that uh, the tactile uh, feedback, the, the way that they navigate or operate it, um, you know, with that touch interface is, is nice and reduces some of the barrier um, that happens sometimes with typing and with um, you know, maneuvering a, a, um, a mouse on the, on the laptop. But we've not had any issues whatsoever um, with, our, with our younger students using the netbooks. I think the sad thing is that people want to just kind of say that um, you know, there's a definitive answer between the two, and, and Ben and I talk about this a lot already. You can add into this, but the people are in one camp and they're out of the other. You know, it's regardless. You know, people in the open source are gonna just ver focus solely on Apple as the big bad evil empire, and then those in the Apple are gonna talk about open source as being, you know, wide open, the wild wild west. And you know, people are are stuck in that opinion. You're not gonna you're not gonna be able to really kind of beat that discussion per se. It just goes back to what we started our discussion, right, Ben? That what do you want to do? What's your previous culture? What's your current budget? You know, I think what's interesting is we leave the uh, iPod Touch out of the discussion, for example. Why? I mean, people are focused on the size of the screen. Well, I never had a kid have ever actually came to me and said, Mr. Mange, you know, my iPod Touch screen is just too small for me to use. I don't know. Well, I'm going to go back to, I looked at, um, you know, B said, would you say that the argument can be made for multimedia classrooms at max the industry standard? Um, I think the whole the notion of industry standard is, is, is a fallible notion um, because it's not what the industry standard is. It's what the kids can create with it. It's what they can do with it. Um, with Audacity, I had a conversation about this not too long ago. I, mean, I have a Mac. I love Macs. Um, but I, I think that sometimes, um, you know, even with GarageBand, I teach a graduate course, uh, technology and literacy instruction uh, with classroom teachers. And the first year I taught it with GarageBand, and the second year, I, and since then, the last five years, I've taught it with Audacity because I found that we could more quickly get our goals accomplished, get a podcast recorded, get it edited, get it done um, quicker than Audacity. So sometimes it's not about that notion of, you know, okay, Apple is known for being, um, you know, graphics, uh, computer, or something like that. I, I think that in a lot of cases you have to dismiss that notion and say, you know, is it possible for kids to successfully do uh, a multimedia experience? And if yes, then that device works. And, and I will say that, you know, Mac does a nice job overall, which is why we have a couple carts of MacBooks. Um, you know, in, in our own purposes. So, um, you know, that, that's it. And, and I would say also, as, um, you know, as Scott alluded to, you know, I, I, started out, I, I gave this presentation about our one-to-one -one, uh, last week at our Illinois State Conference, and I started saying that, and, and I think it's very true. I think people have staked, you know, their, their place in the ground, and they're very unwilling. It's almost like talking religion and politics with people when you talk about a device platform, um, because they have determined what their preference is. And, um, I've heard a lot of people argue the case that because more people have one device, it makes it the right device. And I go back and, and say that you know consensus is really irrelevant to the objectivity of truth. If if something is true, it's true whether you know more people agree with it or believe in it or not. Um, you know, look at for how many years the consensus opinion was the world was flat, and that didn't make that any more true um, because more people believed in it. So don't let yourself be persuaded by market share, by the, the, the notion that more people have it, so it must be relevant. Um, it's, it's not, um, it, it's, it, it, that's not the case. You know, think for yourself, think critically, think deeply, um, and, and make your decision based on what we've discussed uh, tonight. I think, Ben, it's going to be interesting, too, is, you know, 
in the early parts of an experiment, uh, you know, you've done your homework, you do the best you can, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to, you know, professional development. Are the teachers truly ready? What's going to happen in year two, year three to budgets? You know, is there going to be some idea or some factor that's going to impact refresh? You know, is the uh, economy going to continue to get worse? And there's just so many factors into it. You know, what's the real end of life of these devices? You know, I think, you know, we speculate for how old is the iPad? You know, how comfortable are you with the open source movement to continue to develop and make sure that that platform is stable moving forward? Is the netbook truly, uh, you know, like a four to five year end of life cycle? And there's just so much to it. It just still comes back to what are you looking to do with the device? You know, we're really focused on reading, for example, and I see a huge benefit of reading on the iPad. That's another reason our district is probably leaning in that direction more than anything. You know, we, we see platforms such as Google Education Apps is important, but so are using now iTunes U with the new development of the online classes. Uh, also, you know, just podcasting and video casting. I mean, just, you see what I'm saying, everybody? There's just so much to the conversation that's going to be so dependent on your local culture. And, and I will say, too, that, that you know, we, we bought our device understanding that it's going to be relevant for three years and we'll completely evaluate after that three-year cycle. Um, we, we've built that into our plan. Um, you know, we, we believe we can get, you know, more time out of that and we will evaluate at the end of three years if we want to sustain or stay with that device or even keep it for an additional year before we refresh. We've also worked in a parent purchase option where we allow our parents to, to purchase the device over a three-year term to provide a low-cost option for them. Um, you know, through the program. Um, but I think as far as the open source, the question about the open source, um, you look at, you know, go read uh, Here here Comes uh, here comes Everybody by um, Clay Shirty, I think that's the one, where he mentions uh, Linux and explains the Linux project. And, you know, it's generated on interest of a very large community. And it's going to take a long time for that interest to wane within that community because of very devout, very committed community to developing uh, Linux. And so I have no fears. Right now our device is viable. If we made no updates, no changes, it still be viable for three to four years out um, based on what it is that we're doing. It's, it's that stable and it's that good of a, of a platform. Um, and, and I think that it, it'll, it will remain that um, for the years ahead. And, and you know, even Scott, as you said, if you're focusing on reading, you know, what is it the kids are doing when they're blogging, when they're um, in Google Apps? You know, primarily what they're doing is reading. That's, that's the, the primary goal. So why not have them invested in reading and practicing in things of self-selection and self-interest, um, which I think is, is certainly an important part of what they're doing. I think that's um, because you're going back to the idea that Google Education Apps is your focus. And once again, maybe iBooks author is a focus or Pages is our uh, platform of choice. You know, regardless of what you're going to go with, it's still going to have the same kind of effect. Um, really, the biggest difference is still going to come down to economics. You know, right now that the open platform for yourself is less expensive. At the end of the day, that's the hardest discussion. Um, I will point out, though, that once again, I think that eliminates that discussion of what the iDevices bring that the uh, netbooks don't, and I think that we gloss over that. You mentioned clearly in your post that you don't see that hundred and whatever dollar value between the difference of the device to be worth it. And that's where I'm hearing a, a difference of opinion. I think that it is. I think there's lots of people that see that. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to still those initial factors. Hey, ben, I do have one question. I was thinking about this earlier. What's going on with the current netbook model that you guys are using? And uh, what's the future of that model? And are you looking at different ones if you have to change? Yeah, and that, that again is the nice thing about using Ubuntu. We won't use the, we're using HP 1103 this year, which is discontinued, um, but it won't make a difference in our cycle because next year, you know, we, we may go with an ASUS, we may stay with HP, we're currently evaluating, um, but the, the image will be the same. So the experience for the kids won't change um, based on that model. So um, as we continue to refresh devices, even as we look at potentially running tablets, um, you know, in the future, if we can do like the Asus Transformer or some some kind of a tablet, the Transformer is Android right now, but if we looked at some kind of a, tra you know, a, a tablet like that, we could still run um, Ubuntu on it or, or actually run Ubermix on it and it would still work. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're looking at a, at a different netbook device, having conversations right now with vendors um, about that, but I don't, I don't see that as a, as a bad thing or, or a, uh, you know, as a, um, 
anything that inhibits us. Um, and, and I do, and I don't call it, I think you're right, that Windows 8, I think, you know, as much as I'm an Apple person, there's some compelling potential features in Windows 8 that I'm very curious to see um, what, what comes out with that. Uh, all right. Hey, this is actually kind of what I wanted, uh, a little bit of banter back and forth on, on a few different points. And I think there were some, uh, both of you guys just make really compelling arguments. And, and yes, I do see that for the most part you're on the same side in a lot of philosophies. But there are some unique differences that I think you were kind of exploring here um, in the last little bit. Yeah, absolutely. That was kind of what I wanted—a little bit of a throwdown, and and that's and that's what we got. It and I, but again, I think at the end, the the point that resonates with me, and I hope that resonates with you, is that it is much more the, the device part is an interesting conversation, and there are definitely affordances of both. Um, but I think as as educators, I mean, it, it just behooves us to be uh, aware of these affordances so that we're making the the kind of decisions. And, and even if you're not, you, you know, let's face it, both Scott and and Ben. Uh, are in positions where they're uh, highly influential in, in making these decisions. And even as a classroom teacher, I think uh, the important part that I hope you take away from that is that, you know, whether you're looking at a bring your own device uh, situation where maybe you'll have a mix of iPads and, and uh, iPod touches and netbooks and, and PCs, uh, that you understand, you know, kind of what the affordance is of those devices and the ways in which you can help them make, you know, achieve your goals. Because again, I think at the end of the day, I put this in the hands of a teacher with, um, uh, you know, expertise and understanding of how to make this new culture of learning, which is really at the heart of all of this, right? I, it doesn't really matter to me if you have a device, if you don't have no, no idea what you're going to do with it. It just doesn't really matter. So um, I just want to thank everybody for uh, coming and uh, Ben and, Scott in particular for sharing. Sorry for screwing up the first part of it. <laughs> Once we got going, it was actually a really good session. So um, I'm just going to close the recording. And I will make the recording.